Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Shaws. On Wednesday, we concluded the Disney portion of The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. Sleeping Beauty had been cursed by a fairy, stuck her hand on a spindle, and had fallen asleep, and had been rescued, sort of, by a handsome prince. And that's where Disney left it, but that's not where the story ends. So here we go, with part four of The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. They went into the great hall of looking glasses where they supped and were served by the princess's officers. The violins and hot boys played old tunes, but very excellent, though it was now above a hundred years since they had played. And after supper, without losing any time, the Lord Almoner married them in the chapel of the castle, and the chief lady of honor drew the curtains. They had but very little sleep, the princess had no occasion, and the prince left her next morning to return to the city, where his father must needs have been in pain for him. The prince told him that he lost his way in the forest as he was hunting, and that he had lain in the cottage of a charcoal burner who gave him cheese and brown bread. The king his father, who was a good man, believed him, but his mother could not be persuaded it was true, and seeing that he went almost every day a-hunting, and that he always had some excuse ready for so doing, though he had lain out three or four nights together, she suspected that he was married for he lived with the princess above two whole years, and had by her two children, the eldest of which, who was a daughter, was named Morning, and the youngest, who was a son, they called Day, because he was a great deal handsomer and more beautiful than his sister. The queen spoke several times to her son, to inform herself after what manner he did pass his time, and that in this he ought in duty to satisfy her. But he never dared to trust her with his secret. He feared her, though he loved her, for she was of the race of the ogres, and the king would never have married her if it had not been for her vast riches. It was even whispered about the court that she had ogreish inclinations, and that, whenever she saw little children passing by, she had all the difficulty in the world to avoid falling upon them. And so the prince would never tell her one word. But when the king was dead, which happened about two years afterward, and he saw himself lord and master, he openly declared his marriage, and he went in great ceremony to conduct his queen to the palace. They made a magnificent entry into the capital city, she riding between her two children. Soon after, the king went to make war with the emperor Condlebut, his neighbor. He left the government of his kingdom to the queen, his mother, and earnestly recommended to her care his wife and children. He was obliged to continue his expedition all the summer, and as soon as he departed, the queen mother sent her daughter-in-law to a country house among the woods, that she might, with the more ease, gratify her horrible longing. And that is where we're going to stop this week, and on Monday... We'll pick up with the end, we'll discover the Queen Mother's horrible longing, and we'll see the end of the Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. This is Dan Schultz of the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you'd like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you'd like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening.